All right, so um, this is actually the last sort of learning module, uh, diversity and practice, uh, combined with critical thinking. Um, before we shift over to your uh, sharing with us uh, the different aspects of biblical foundation in social work, we'll talk about that on Friday. And in terms of your paper, a couple of you have already turned in your last reflection paper. Uh, what I want you to do is just focus on answering the questions from chapter 10, those six items. You don't need to go through chapter 11 doing all the um, ethical decision tree, uh, decision making. Um, that'll be fine if you just go ahead and do chapter 10. And then re also remember that your uh, book review report is due by next Monday. Okay. So... We're going to focus in on um, John. This is where I am in, this, in Scripture this morning is John chapter 14. And let's go ahead and read the first six verses. And we'll talk about it in relationship to diversity and practice. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If... If it were not so, would I, have not, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, where that where I am you may also be. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, you know, we're about to talk about diversity in practice. And a lot of different areas of, of study talk about the importance of diversity uh, in terms of their own profession and their own discipline. But social work is really the only area of study on this campus where it's actually written as part of your competency you must actually be able to professionally practice with people from all different uh, backgrounds and differences. And, we, and for the most part, we celebrate that, uh, whether from a biblical perspective or from a secular perspective. But we want to first take hold and look at, from a biblical perspective, right, that we understand that, uh, in, in we see in verse 2, right, there are, the Lord set us up in a way that there is diversity. There is many rooms. There's many places to be in his kingdom. But there's only one way, right? There's only one way to truth and life, and that is through Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we celebrate sort of the dichotomy there, that dialectic, that for God it always holds together that there's diversity, but also unity, and that unity only comes through our Lord and Savior. So now we take that. First of all, any, any thoughts? Any thoughts as you read chapter 10 and you thought about diversity and, and you think about it in relationship to, um, to God's understanding and what he has ordained as diversity? Any thoughts? Caitlin, can I pick on you? Um, we also have a common goal in social work to promote well-being for our clients, no matter what their situation looks like. Um, so just kind of like we have that common goal in Christ, we also have that common goal. Mm -hmm. That's good. Anyone else want to have something that they think about when they read John 14? Okay, well, um, what I want to do today is we're going to spend today talking about why is it so important, diversity is so important in our profession. And I want to build sort of a logical con uh, uh, context for that to make sense to us. And then, depending on our time, on Wednesday, we will go into talking about things like privilege, talking about the five faces of oppression, and then also the different dimensions of diversity. Um, you know, we, again, remember we had Mr. Cooper, we had our visitor last week. 
And we see with every single case that you've read so far uh, that every single case there's lots of things that kind of come together that we have to understand to be competent with no matter who we're working with, right? And so um, it is an important part of who we are as a profession. But let's, let me go through and sort of make it sense for, to, for, to you and for me, why is diversity in practice so important? I had to wrestle with this myself in terms of one of the things that I want you to do as students is not to just take what I tell you or take what you read in a book and just agree because that's what's there. So if diversity in practice is going to be such an important part of your competency, you should be able to make sense of why that is the case. All right, so we talked about at the beginning some sort of key foundational things. By now you should know that social work really is a complex and dynamic profession. We work with so many people to enhance and restore well-being, no matter where they are in life, no matter what size system, right, whether they're individuals, groups, families, organizations. And we see that social work is more than just a scientific professional field. You've heard me say it's, it's, sort, of a, it's sort of a synthesis of who you are, your own beliefs, your own awareness, with um, the things that you're learning, the things you're learning in scripture, but also the things you're learning in school, and then the ability to take all that and use it in the process of a helping relationship, a professional helping relationship. So social workers' core values, do you remember? Can anyone list uh, one of the core values? Those of you that will be going up for a, admission to our program, you'll have to know all six values. Service is the first one. Social justice. Integrity. 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 Dignity and worth, worth of people or the important, yep. Yeah. The importance of human relationships. The importance of human relationships and one more. You've heard me say the word already a couple times. Confidence. You, you must be able to do the things that we're teaching you. It's not enough to be able to read about it, write about it, take an, an exam. You must actually demonstrate. So later on, when you go when you get into our program, a lot of the assignments are things where we're watching you practice. You'll do a role play. We'll we'll uh, assess you. Um, Caitlin can attest to in a group class. You're actually going to be in a group practicing as you're learning. So. So that's a key. Um, and you have to know about so many different things. So w this is one of the few areas where every single course you take is relevant. So whether you're taking art or um, economics or anthropology, every single course you take actually may become information that allows us to engage with clients or client systems. And uh, you've you also heard us talk about sort of how uh, that has created a lot of tension for us as a profession in our standing, right? Because we try to do so many things for so many people that oftentimes we're not experts in anything. We're just really competent in lots of things. What we're best at is linking people with the right resources, with the ability to help those individually, but also as a group, and also to do so in such a way as there is... Um, to support their human rights, to uphold self-determination, which is going to be one of the topics that you'll be talking about. Freedom, privacy. Uh, we believe that everyone should have an adequate standard of living, health care, and education, free and access to those things. So as part of that now, as you hear me say all that, that sort of creates the context by which, again, we don't just say diversity in practice because it's a competency. You actually must be able to demonstrate because we say all of those things are important, because self-determination is so important to us and we value basic human rights, um, we really do celebrate, not enhance, but we actually celebrate 
all forms of diversity. We celebrate all dimensions of diversity. Um, and beyond that, we also recognize, and I want you to understand that not everybody sees diversity the way we see it, as something to understand, learn, grow. But unfortunately, because of the fall that we've talked about, um, the things that we want to celebrate about people and their differences are the very same things that are used on this side of the cross to decipher who gets what, to uh, sometimes uh, decide who takes more and who gets less, uh, who has access to opportunity and who doesn't. Um, and f for all many different reasons, but throughout history, uh, those things that are diverse uh, that we think about and we want to celebrate uh, can become the reasons why people decide to separate and decipher and look at things differently, right? Um, let me ask a couple of you, can you think about so far uh, any examples of cases that we've read or even Mr. Cooper where you see sort of based on who he is or, or what things you've read that have caused them to have to be seen and work with, by, with a social worker. Think through some of the cases. What cases do you think where diversity played a role? That all of them, but I want you to mention some of them. Um, I think it was a girl named Erica who was trying to get into the gifted program at the school and was denied. Right, so by her very, and that what, what, kind of, what dimensions of diversity are going on there? Um, I think the race. Was kind of race, and what else? Social status, gender, anything else? Guess what, her age. The most, the most oppressed group of folks in society are children. They're the, we're in, especially in American culture, uh, children are the poorest group or population you'll work with. They have the least power, the least say. Someone pick another case that we've heard. And let's talk about the, the different areas that have uh, influenced that case. I don't remember the name, um, but there was a lady who called a crisis center, and she was like, hallucinating that her husband was still alive. I was talking about situations with that, um, but she also wasn't able to like get, have access to her medications, I think is what was also going on. Right, so uh, husband lost, uh, died. I think we also we have age issues, we have mental health issues, we have, um, didn't she lose her ability to pay her bills, if I'm not mistaken? I may be confusing uh, that as well. Very good. Anyone else? Madeline. And and what what dimensions do you think played a role there? Um, sexuality. Sexuality. Age as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you see that uh, although for us we celebrate all different dimensions of diversity, because again for us our faith is not academic. Right? And what we believe, even if we have issues with, uh, for instance, sexual, uh, sexual orientation as being uh, something that is of sin, right? still for social workers, we're going to work with anybody because we believe everyone's made in the Im image of God. Right? So we, you still must be competent and ab the ability to appreciate where they're coming from and how to engage so you can be, what we talk about, that servant of common grace to them. Right? even to have a trusting relationship enough so that, who knows, maybe by interacting with you, they get to see someone who does love the Lord, and you might have an opportunity to share with that person at some point. All right, so, so it's important to see that these dimensions of diversity can cause all kinds of reasons why people uh, may feel uh, that they are either... Um, marginalized or oppressed or alienated and uh, so it's a very important value for us to consider there's two things that I want you to remember for diversity 
and I guess we, we'll, we will have time to go into the concept of privilege and the five faces of oppression today a little bit. Um, but there's two things I want you to think about in terms of diversity for us in practice is that we always hold two things uh, uh, at the same time. So when we work with individuals, when we work with clients that come in, one thing about dimensions of diversity is that we use our lens and our competence to understand all the different possibilities of diversity as something that makes people unique, right? So we have to, we look at them, each individual client, because Service to clients is the number one value, remember, of the six values. So we use dimensions of diversity as something that gives us eyes to see and understand. And in our field, being a competent social worker it really means you're going to become a, a lifelong learner as you interact with all different kinds of people. It's impossible. You're not going to know and have competency on every single difference, every single culture you're going to work with, every single person. But if you have a, the, remember that in that reciprocal relationship, the idea that you can engage with them with the professional skills that you do have, and that willingness to learn about who you're working with, you can then help navigate and be, a, and, and as a professional helper, to help them assess what's needed, help them choose interventions that are appropriate, help them to implement an intervention, and help them to actually evaluate an intervention. All right, so on one hand, diversity has to do with the uniqueness of people, right? The other side, though, of the, the dimensions of diversity for us as professional helpers is we have to also, we use that information to understand and learn about different cultures and groups. So while we don't want to stereotype people, we do use both. We, we celebrate individualism and the uniqueness of each person made in, in the image of God, but also we use the dimensions of diversity in our, and, and develop competence and diversity just to get an understanding of how someone's culture might affect how you work with them. Uh, this is a little bit put on the spot, but let me ask and see if you remember. Can you think of any of the cases so far where the actual culture of the group, the client or the group, actually came into play with how the social worker was going to be able to navigate the situation? I can think of about five or six. Let me give you one to warm you up. Remember when Sarah Ormsby is in India? She has to understand the entire culture that she is, as she's working as a missionary overseas, as she sees and, and, undis and discovers that there possibly is something unethical going on with the, the funds, if she's going to create an intervention that's going to be effective, she has to have at least a working knowledge of where she's living, of, who, of how things are, are get done. Um, gender differences, for instance. She has to understand if in her cult in that culture, can she go directly to a supervisor to talk about it? Should she address someone else to go with her? So I'll give you an example for in, in my practice. Uh, oftentimes when I've had to work with uh, clients who were Hispanic or Latino, um, it was important that at discharge, whether I liked it or not, whether I believed that there shouldn't be gender uh, differences. It was important if I wanted a discharge plan to have a chance to be enacted, it was important to have both mom and dad there, to be able to talk to dad directly about what's needed for that particular client. It doesn't matter if my own personal feelings, if I don't think that's right, that I should be able to talk to the mom and the mom should be able to handle it, but Knowing that culture, I know that if I needed to get something where I wanted to make sure it was followed through, the dad had to be there as well. Okay? Um, can you think of other cases that we've read about where the general culture, not the individual person, but the general culture of the group came into play? Thank you. 
the whole Jewish background, right? Very important. Good one. What about Lancaster? Do you remember that one? Even rural, rural and urban. Living in, that, in her particular town, that was going to matter, and understanding that, that culture is important to be able to function well there. Remember the fact that she was from there, that she went to church there, she knew everybody there. What else? Any others? Okay. And trying to find out whether she should go to the community hospital and leave her sister or stay and what kind of treatment to do for that. Right. And, and the social worker needs to try to think through whether separating them right, is not okay. Very good. What about the, what about the um, I don't know if you've read this case yet, of the, the uh, grandmother from Korea who's living at home and is having trouble maintaining uh, her daily activities of daily living. She feels trapped, right? That, that culture plays there. What about the one where, where um, the social worker goes to investigate the school social worker? Why has this one young lady not been coming to school? Do you remember that one? Do you remember why she wasn't coming to school? Not quite. The school had a rule, a policy about no hats, about no headgear. And she wore a hijab. And so the school wanted her to take that off. Do you remember that? And so the dad kept her home. So understanding group dynamics, group cultural influences, is part of, yes, the engagement, but then again, when we do a comprehensive assessment, it's one of the areas that we have to at least assess and evaluate so that we can make good decisions. OK, so if certain folks are um, I want to talk briefly about privilege. I don't call it white privilege, but just privilege. That if there are certain groups that are oppressed, and even the Lord talks about fighting for the oppressed, okay, and even our role, right, there's a reason why God says that um, pure religion, right, is to care for the orphan and the widowed and to keep one blameless, okay? Obviously, there's something else going on there that he knows from the fall that people aren't doing that. So, Privilege has to do with getting access, or how I, un I understand in very layman terms, is the ability to leverage oneself to the marketplace, or to access to stuff, or ideas, or to make the rules, or the, or the, or the rules of how life should happen. Um, who should access commerce? Um, and these folks, if you have privilege, there's just certain in benefits uh, that sort of separate or allow you to operate uh, without having to worry about stuff. And I always give the example, so as a Jewish, Messianic Jewish man, uh, the first time I went to the South to go live in the South, uh, one of the first things my father said when we moved to North Carolina is, do you know where your people are? And I was, that struck me as odd. Why would I need to know where my people are? But what he was saying is, if something bad happened, do I know where all the other Jewish people are in that community? Are there any Jews there? That might be something that you, you just never grow up thinking about if you aren't a member of a minority. But for me, inherently, uh, going through 10 years of Hebrew school where all we were taught was about the Holocaust and, and being oppressed and being uh, collected and rounded up, that's something that was ingrained in my father. 
and it was important for him to make sure I knew. So it's a w it's it's an it's an interesting kind of phenomenon. Um, so let's talk about the five faces of oppression. And I actually uh, I actually um, think of six. I actually usually teach it as six. First of all, let me give you a definition for oppression is the use of power to disenfranchise or marginalize particular individuals or groups. So that's the opposite of privilege. There's five faces of, oppre of oppression. The first one I always talk about before the exploitation is joking. Any of you ever hear or when you talk about jokes about people and their backgrounds, right? Um, what joking does, even though it sounds lighthearted, and I'm guilty of it, or uh, I make fun of my own stereotypes as a Jewish messianic man, um, and I could ask you what you think some of those stereotypes are, um, but I won't. Um, what it does, though, after the, after the laugh, is you're creating a situation, or we, you create a situation where people are, you're, you're saying without saying that people, this group is a little different than other groups. And when you do that, the danger is, is that it begins to dehumanize or look, or creates the opportunity to look at a different population that's different from you as different. Now think about what we just said about John 14, and now we're looking at sort of joking about people that are different. How one, there's only one way to the truth in life, and now in our brokenness and our desire to sort of divide people up or even just to have fun or to joke, just by making that joke or creating that thing where it's lighthearted, it all of a sudden creates where they're a little different. The group is a little different than others. I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but just think about for a minute if you've ever experienced that. If you've ever experienced being either the one who's being part of the joke or you're around other friends who are making those jokes, how it made you feel, or if you were ever the recipient of those jokes. Okay, so when with joking, the next face of oppression is called exploitation. Exploitation occurs when differences in group characteristics are used by the members of the dominant group to define the rules of work, which makes it easier for that group to gain access to, commun 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 uh, gain access to wealth in society, cumulative wealth. Systematic and structural exploitation can occur in such a way where the differences in standard of living and the power where decisions about work and the levels of pay are seen as normal or natural. We shouldn't covet, right? We shouldn't, we shouldn't wish for more. Think back to the decision. Was it Erica, I think, tonight? That one decision, right, could actually really alter this young girl's life. If she's told that she really should just stay in the average class, even though she, acts, she actually qualifies, f even by the rules, to be in gifted and talented or gifted uh, learning, um, just because two administrators made that decision, that could have a lot of impact on this young girl's life. So it, 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 for us as social workers, remember going back to that thorn that for many of us, why we're here, 
Um, you know, that comes from 2 Corinthians. But why, you know, for some people can just let that go. Or, oh, there's nothing that we can do about it. But for God creates some of us in here who just, it just gets at us. We can't let it go. And it's what we are called to fight against, called to advocate for, and so forth. Um, and here's what's sad is, what happens is structurally systems can be in place and it's just seen as the way it is. The rules in and of themselves sometimes can actually be, like everyone individually might just know to follow the rules, but they just don't know that the rules and how they were originally created were done in such a way that it's decided on um, much long before. And it doesn't have to always think about, if you're thinking in your mind that it has to do with race or gender, uh, let me just suggest to you that, uh, how many of you here say you want to go into like clinical work, therapy? Sort of, okay. So um, one of the things to re recognize and why, um, one of the things, the struggles from a biblical perspective to grab hold of mental health issues, uh, I'm actually going to be giving a, sp a talk at a local Christian high school on Wednesday about mental health issues with kids. One of the things that a Christian context struggles with in terms of diversity and exploitation is that most of the diagnoses that are thought of as mental illness, real mental illness diagnoses, the DSM-4, have you ever heard of the DSM-5, DSM-5R, right? The Diagnostic Statistical Manual. Um, when those, when that book was first created, when those diagnoses were first established, very first, they were essentially established by European white men. Think about that. When, we get, when you get to research methods, we'll talk about how a construct is developed, how it's defined. Most of the, di the actual different diagnoses, what counts, what doesn't count, when to say it's this and when to say it's that. And of course, there's newer versions, right? And each version probably gets better, but you never lose the base of where it first was originated from. So from an Afrocentric perspective, when you get to your senior year, uh, you'll talk about how um, even cultural competence in social work, one of the things that we have to improve upon is that we tend to use our cultural competence to engage clients. We're getting better at assessing clients, but then we try to put them into interventions that are really Western Euro European uh, created. There aren't a lot of uh, intervention focused on from an Afrocentric perspective. Okay, marginalization. So exploitation is that first face. Marginalization is, occurs when the dominant group decides the system of labor cannot or will not use certain people. Marginals are people that lack the skills needed to find and maintain employment and are thought of economically as dependent and then essentially irrelevant. Okay, where did we just talk about who can work and who can't? Marginals is just another term for what we were talking about just a couple weeks ago. Do you remember? What term did the Elizabethan poor laws use? Rachel, what do you think? Remember, you, you, you wrote, each wrote, wrote about this in your uh, reflection paper. You had to decide whether you understand or what you, whether you agree with the terms worthy and unworthy poor. Do you remember that? The laws by which basically our social welfare system is based on, where we determine eligibility by a whole bunch of factors. There's something 
economics, uh, em economic folks use to assess uh, things called the uh, dependency ratio. The dependency ratio is an assessment of people that are of working age that they think can contribute to the tax base over folks that aren't working. And there's really elaborate models that are uh, out there that show sort of where we are and why we're headed to a certain way uh, because there's not enough people contributing to the taxes as there are taking the taxes. Well, the whole concept of dependency ratio for us as social workers is problematic because you're basically saying they're marginals. I thought everybody was made in God's image. I thought there's only one way to the truth in life, right? And so something doesn't align there for us when we begin to think about folks that way. Do you think that Mr. Cooper has experienced being a marginal? I mean, he's overcome a lot. But do you think he is fighting upstream? I mean, it's a leading question. Should he just accept where he is? Okay, we'll cover powerlessness and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll finish up and then we'll get to the last two on Wednesday. Powerlessness is the extra burdens endured by people who are not considered professionals. Professionals exercise more power in the workplace. They can work with considerably more autonomy. They can make more money. And they can elicit more social societal respect because of their higher educational level and the higher value placed on their work. And here's the kicker. Individuals who belong to dominant groups tend to have more access to the resources needed to reach professional status. So now we're getting into who are the CEOs, who are in the professional positions. I'm on the Mental Health Recovery Board for uh, the surrounding three counties, and we meet all the, uh, once a month. And we were creating, uh, we have an ad hoc committee uh, to address uh, racial and, and um, diversity issues in the county and whether or not there are, um, whether we respond well. And so there was a lot of work. We created like this one page document of what we do and do not stand for. That seemed great. But here is again back to the powerlessness. One of the things I shared on the group is, well, if you look at the staff, at the Mental Health Recovery Board, everyone's white. So I said, if we really want to change, we should look for opportunities for people that look different from us from, to actually serve on the board. The other thing that makes it very difficult for, uh, to enhance diversity in all of the agencies, and uh, you got to experience it Friday, um, with Mr. Cooper is that so the, the Mental Health Recovery Board uh, distributes about $15 million a year to all uh, mental health service agencies in the three counties surrounding uh, Cedarville. Um, it is very difficult to, so on one hand it seems like from the outside that so people write a grant or they write a proposal, they seek money for services and the your taxpayer dollars for that, uh, that, that go to uh, provide these services, we oversee and make sure that they're spent wisely. And that seems like a good check and balance. Uh, it is extremely difficult for a new agency to get to be considered a provider status to even have a chance to write a proposal to get funding from us. So the same, usually the same 
agencies get the same kinds of money year after year after year. Well, I, and I, I've only been on this, on this board for a year and a half now. Um, we talk about trying to change. We talk about it, and we're, mo we're moving a little bit. COVID kind of stopped everything. Um, but, it, but think about it. Think about for, for Mr. Cooper, who has a plan to create a new program. And I know some of you uh, reading your case uh, reviews, your case dec decision cases, like this idea of creating a new program. We have to have funding to do it. And so what happens is, uh, in the three counties, the three biggest providers of services, which do good work, but over time sometimes, in doing the good work and, and receiving the largest money, uh, uh, largest distribution of the f those funds, they get stagnant. So there's not a whole lot of competition for anything, for anything that's different, for people that's different, for new kinds of ideas and treatment ideas that's different. Last year was the first time that the board approved a private, for-profit uh, organization to receive funds. First time ever. I think that's great because it allows lots, of, lots more competition and it helps keep all of the other agencies in check. Um, but again, so for someone like Mr. Cooper to break in, have a good idea, meet the right people, get an opportunity for funding to actually implement it, just think about how difficult that is going to be. And that's just one person. OK, let's end by asking, uh, what are you taking away from today? A couple of you. Isabel, what are you taking away from today? I never really thought of that, honestly. Um, cause I grew up in a mostly white community, and I guess joking about diversity, like it never really impacted other people. Um, mm. But now that I look at that from a different perspective, I realize that that is part of that. Mm -hmm. Lauren. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I knew you were over here somewhere. I always confuse you, Sarah. And <laughs> um, yeah, I took away basically the same thing, um, but also um, just the impact that it has on other people um, who are minorities, which is, is kind of dumb because it's like obviously it has an impact, but when you said after the laughter ends, um, for you like it still impacts you and like um, changes how people see who other people are. Um, it's just a reminder as a Christian to always have that um, guard on our tongue, because mm -hmm. the tongue is the greatest weapon of all. Um, and so that was a very important reminder for me. Lindsay. Mark, can we go? Um, a big takeaway for me today is uh, the multiple different um, facets of diversity, where it's like it, it's not just one dimension, it's multiple dimensions like age, um, race, sexuality, like all those different dimensions all go in together to form these ideas that a culture may have. Mm -hmm. And the, dif the differences in those cultures are important whenever it comes to being in a position like on the mental health board. Right. And you bring up a good point because, again, on this campus, you've heard biblically, we have an issue. I, I think biblically, critical race theory doesn't align biblically. But we don't throw out all of it, right? It still helps us understand how to help people. Uh, just because it doesn't align with the gospel, we're all fallen. We have to sometimes use fallen tools. 
um, with the right guidance, uh, grounded in Scripture to see how maybe the Lord would see this whole situation. Um, and so I, it gives us, as social workers, more tools in our belt to see things from different angles. The more angles we can see, the more opportunities for better interventions. Very good. All right, so we'll finish up. We'll talk about the last two phases of oppression on Wednesday. We'll talk about the different dimensions, and we'll get start getting serious about your presentation, which I would humbly suggest that you have your slides done probably by Friday. You've had all semester. <laughs>